I'm going to ask, if you will, if you'd open your Bibles to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter number three. As we come to this last Sunday of 2019 and we look forward to the new year, I think back on the end of last year and uh, as we look at a new year, we, uh, I, I guess God kind of on purpose doesn't let us know uh, the things that we're going to go through, the things that's going to be in the new year. I think maybe if we knew sometimes what our future would hold, uh, we would probably um, maybe go crazy uh, trying to prepare or avoid or, or get ready for. Uh, but uh, as we think about the new year, uh, it, it's like uh, God gives us the new Sunday every week. Uh, God moving uh, that Sunday would be the Lord's Day where it, it uh, originally was the Sabbath. Saturday uh, was the day of rest. That was the day that people were uh, originally to worship God and, and some still follow that through. Some of the Jewish, some of the uh, Seventh-day Adventists, d different ones still use the Old Testament and make the Sabbath their, uh, their holy day. Of course, when Jesus came, uh, after Jesus was crucified, Jesus resurrected on that Sunday morning, and that became to the early church uh, the Lord's Day, the day that we set aside, the day that we come together. And that being Sunday, the first day of the week, uh, I think that was in God's wisdom uh, that he gave us this first day of the week to come together, to get ready for uh, the new week. And so we get the chance, the opportunity uh, to begin the new week, a fresh start. Uh, if we do it the way God intends by being in church, being together with God's people, the family of God coming together to encourage one another. And, and so it is that we have that first uh, every week, uh, that Lord's Day, the Sunday. Uh, and so we get to have a new year. Uh, that uh, uh, as we look at it, uh, as I said a few weeks ago, when we, when we date our check, whether you acknowledge it or not, people acknowledge it or not, uh, when we put that date on there, uh, that, that acknowledges something that happened in time, uh, how we count our calendar, uh, that Jesus was born. And if it were that Jesus would have been, been born and, and the time started at zero, there's some question there as to whether uh, there's three or four years maybe there that it could be different. But if he were born at, at, at the beginning of our calendar, zero AD, he would have died uh, on 33 AD. We know that he lived to be 33 years old. And so I'm thinking about as we look toward the new year, uh, a chance to, to, to get a fresh start. And, and I, I've told you many times that, you know, people do the resolutions. I'm not much on, on setting resolutions because I don't like to, you know, start something I know I'm going to break. And that's kind of how resolutions are. Uh, I saw someone this week, uh, I guess they were getting ready to start a, a, a resolution and and uh, they had posted on their Facebook page, if somebody knew where a, a good cheap, and then they put maybe free uh, a treadmill, they, they were in the market. And I'm thinking, okay, so they, they're, they're getting ready for the new year. They're going to start this plan. And, and some smart aleck posted on there, you need something to hang your clothes on. Uh, so, you know, kind of knowing where they would be headed with that new year's resolution. But, but people do, uh, we get to the first of the year, a start, a new, new, new beginning. And, and we think about things we want to do, whether it's, you know, physical health wise, diet wise, financial wise, it's, you know, the, the time for beginning, the time for making these, these changes and those type things. And so as we approach the new year, and that's a chance, uh, you know, a lot of businesses uh, that, that don't have different fiscal years, this is a, a time where they have to take their inventory, they take an account. Um, the IRS has a tendency to require we do that in, in some businesses uh, that we take a, an account, take an inventory and, and kind of count up and see whether you were successful or not. If, if you're not real sure, uh, the beginning of the year is a chance to do that. And so as we look at this new year and we think about all the challenges and, and, and the opportunities and, and the chances to begin again, and as I was thinking about that this week and, and, and what to do here at the, the end of the year to the new year and thinking about the message, and, and I looked at this passage of scripture here in Philippians. And uh, you think about Paul. I've got several biographies uh, uh, of Paul, different people that have studied his life. And, and just a few months ago, I had the opportunity to watch a movie I'd been wanting to see for quite some time, and it's The Apostle Paul. Uh, and it was told from the perspective uh, of his life after he had gone to Rome. And uh, you'll remember how Paul... Uh, after he had been um, 
uh, uh, persecuted. Uh, he, had, he had appealed to, 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 to Augustus and to Caesar and to Felix, to all of the, the, the governors and, and all of the politicians that he could. And, and finally, when it came down to the very last, and they were going to be charging Paul with, with all of the charges of treason and everything, just like they had done much with Jesus. And, and, and remember that Paul was about 10 years younger than Jesus was from, from what the historians tell us. And, and Paul, even though he is known as an apostle, uh, he tells us that he was an apostle abnormally born. And, and what he means by that is that uh, to be an apostle, uh, one of the, the definitions of an apostle is that they would have lived during the time that Jesus lived, that Jesus would have taught them personally. They would have, would have followed him personally. And, and Paul comes along some 10 years younger. And from all of the accounts we have, uh, Paul wasn't actually converted. You'll remember that Paul was out persecuting the church. And somewhere around 34 AD, which would have been about a year after the resurrection, uh, Paul encountered as he was on his way to Damascus to, to persecute the church, that he gives that in his own testimony in the scripture. Uh, there's some extra biblical literature that that fills some of that in that tells us that they believe Paul was converted around 34, which was a year after the resurrection. And Paul tells us that he was on his way to Damascus and he encountered the resurrected Jesus. Now this is about a year after um, the resurrection, if, if those historical accounts are true. And so Paul would have encountered Jesus in about 34 AD. He was converted. He was gloriously saved, transformed, his life changed. And, and then he spent some time, and, and, and the historians tell us that it would have been a few years there before he actually started on his missionary journeys. And so on those journeys, those missionary trips, and we have a count of those uh, if, if we piece together the history uh, of the Bible and again, some extra biblical uh, readings that tells us when he, he founded the churches, when he wrote the different letters. And so Paul's life, if he would have been saved at 34, he started those missionary journeys and he would have made a trip with Luke. Uh, and like I said, in this movie that I had the opportunity to see, and it went right along with some of the biographies that I had read, it was the time when Paul would have been in Rome he was in prison. Uh, th there's scriptural accounts that tells us he spent two years in Rome in his own home, a ho home that he rented there. That's the time that he was under house arrest. But after that time, uh, he was actually placed in the Roman prison. Uh, he had appealed to Nero. And so Nero had again, like the other governors, the other politicians had done, they, they did much like they did with Jesus. Nobody wanted to take the responsibility for actually putting him to death. And so finally, when he did appeal to Nero, he was in the Roman prison. Uh, he had visited these different churches. And, and as he was in prison, different ones would visit him. And through that, he would dictate some of these letters that have become our Bible. And so somewhere about 62, 64 AD, Paul has been a Christian now for about 30, 32 years. Uh, you, you, you can imagine that as the lifestyle of, of what he would have done founding those churches, these missionary journeys. And so now about 32 years after he saved, he dictates this letter uh, that gets written to the Philippians. It was during this time that he was in the Roman prison uh, he writes what we call the, the, the church epistles. These are the letters to uh, Thessalonians, to Colossians, uh, to Corinthians. He, he writes two of those. Uh, he writes the, the, the letter here to the ones in the region of Philippi, which becomes Philippians. And so Paul is talking to the church. He, he spends, remember in, in, in Corinthians, he's correcting the church. Uh, he spends a lot of time correcting their, their theology and their practices. And so here in Philippians chapter three, uh, he's getting ready to teach the church, but he's also wanting to encourage the church. And so in that, as, as I said, I was thinking about this new year and, and how we approach the new year. And so we look at scripture something like Philippians chapter number three, and we get the teachings from Paul that, that's to be an encouragement. Now remember, Paul knows that he is about to die. He knows his time on earth is, is about over. 
Uh, he's appealed to all of these leaders. Uh, they've all passed him off to others. He's, he said, I want to see Nero. I want to go to Rome. Uh, they've arranged that. He goes to Rome. He's imprisoned in Rome. Nero has now said, there's nothing I'm going to do for you. Uh, if they're going to charge you with treason, uh, the penalty for that is death by beheading. And Paul knows this. And so Paul in that time, I mean, think about where we would be if, if we knew because of our faith that we were going to face death, if we knew because of our faith, uh, and, and, and for Paul, this just encouraged him all the more to, to teach, to leave a witness for these people. Um, I was reading even this week that uh, over in, in, in one of the, the Middle Eastern countries that there were, uh, uh, again, Christians this week, and I even double-checked because I had seen this very similar report sometime before, uh, and it was dated December 23rd. It was this, this week that there were 10 Christians uh, who were beheaded by ISIS because nothing more than just being a Christian. And, and so that was going on in Paul's day. Just because you're a Christian, just because you're teaching Christ. And Paul knowing this, Paul still spends this time teaching and, and, and whether Paul knew or not that these letters were going to preserve, be preserved for, for all time, God certainly knew this. And so God to encourage not only the church in Philippi, but to encourage us. Uh, God has had this preserved. And so Paul knowing death is imminent, Paul knowing I'm not going to be here much longer, and Paul knowing I have one last opportunity to talk to this church by way of letter, and, and this is what I want you to, to do, this is what I want you to, to be challenged with. And so we find that there in Philippians chapter 3. If you would, let's stand as we read that together. And, and, and remember, this is Paul knowing what's happening, knowing what's going to be taking place in just the next few weeks, few months. And, and Paul's goal here is to encourage us, the church. And this is what Paul says in Philippians chapter three, and we're gonna begin reading at verse number seven. Paul is looking at his life. Remember, this is the guy that said, I, I, I have this thorn in the flesh, and I've sought God three times. I've begged God to take this away. And, and, and God won't answer this prayer the way I want it answered. But God just says, my grace is sufficient. This is the guy that spends his life encouraging the church, leading people to Jesus. This is the preacher that, that, that just a, a little bit before this, uh, this is the guy that's preaching. And, and the King James puts it, he preaches a long-winded sermon. And, and this guy falls out of a third story window listening to his preaching and falls dead. And, and Paul goes and, and puts himself on top of this guy's body. This is Eutychus and, and, and Paul prays for him and life comes back in him. This is that guy. And now he knows he's about to die. He's seen the power of God. He's seen God bring people back to life. He's experienced the resurrected Jesus physically and personally. And now he's got a chance to tell you something in his last message to you, and this is what he says. When I look at my life, everything that was a gain to me, I've considered that to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I've suffered the loss of all things and consider them just filth so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection, the, the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. 
Not that I've already reached the goal or not that I'm already fully mature, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, all who are mature should think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. Let's pray. God, we thank you again for this Lord's day. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for men like Paul. God, that sacrificed everything. And God, when he was facing physical death, he was thinking about you, thinking about the church, thinking about our relationship with Christ. And one of the last things he did was to try to encourage the church. God, we pray today that the Holy Spirit's presence in this place, and God, we know that presence is promised. God, we ask that that Holy Spirit would encourage those today that are discouraged. God, that the Holy Spirit would strengthen those that are here today that, that find that their faith is at a very low place. God, there's those here today that have decisions, decisions about their health and, and, and what the doctors are wanting them to do, tests they're facing, surgery they're facing. God, there's those here that are facing decisions about the job. God, there's those here that are facing decisions about their personal life. God, there's those here that have gone through traumatic changes in their life beyond their control. And God, they're just needing you to reach into their life and give them wisdom, give them strength, give them courage, give them faith. And God, we know that all of that is in your word. And God, we ask that that word would just speak to us today, that the Holy Spirit would just minister to us and that as this word challenges us, that we would make a commitment that as we go into this new year, whatever the future brings, God, we're gonna serve you and serve you faithfully. God, we're gonna, we're gonna put our faith in you. We're gonna trust you. We're gonna depend on you because God, the, the world doesn't have the answers and many times we don't have the answers. But God, we know that you do. And God, you tell us in your word that if we lack wisdom, we can ask you, and that you don't judge us, but you give us that wisdom. God, that if we need courage or strength, God, the things that we need in our life, we can ask you. And as Paul tells us, through your faith, through our relationship with Jesus, God, you will work those things out in our life. And we're depending on you to do that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I, I want us to look at this just a little bit as we look at Paul's writing here as we think about what he's considering, as I said, as he realizes where he is in his life, knowing that his life is about over. And for us, we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what this year brings. Or we may have plans. We may think we know. We may think we've got things planned out like our finances or or, or things on the job, and, and, and all of us know if we've lived long enough that, that things can change, plans can change. And so we have to be dependent upon God. And so what Paul says here is to encourage the church, and that is to encourage us, again, whether Paul knew or not that this would become part of our holy Bible, God knew it, and God inspired. Remember, all scripture is given by God, and it's profitable for instruction, for doctrine, for teaching, for correction. And so when, when God inspired, and that means God breathed in and breathed out, when God breathed this word out to Paul and Paul wrote this letter to the church, God knew 
that this was going to be in the Holy Scripture to be our encouragement as we look at the conclusion of 2019 going into 2020 and, and all that that's going to bring. And while we may not know all of that, God does. And so we look at what Paul is saying here and, and you look at what Paul says. Look there in, 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 in chapter three, verses seven and eight. Paul says, everything that was a gain to me, the things in life that were were pluses, the things in life that were a benefit, the things in life that were positive. When things were going good, Paul says, where I am today, I look at those things and I consider those things, even the positive things, the good things, the benefits. He says, I consider those a loss when I consider my relationship with Christ. When I consider the difference Christ has made in my life. You, you remember we've talked about many times over this past year about the, the difference Christ brings in our life when we meet Christ. And, and as we looked last week, as we had it portrayed for us last week, and, and, and the ones that portrayed it did a wonderful job last week of showing us when God sent Jesus to this world and how God changed those lives, that those people just had ordinary, everyday common people lives like we do. I mean, you look at, 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 at the portrayal of Zechariah and Elizabeth and, and well on in years and past childbearing years and then God comes along and, and something they totally didn't expect and God comes along and, and he sends the angel and the angel comes and, and talks to Zechariah and begins to tell Zechariah how God's gonna change his life and everything is gonna be different. Can you imagine? I mean, well on in years, past childbearing years, and the angel comes, and, and no doubt Zachariah and Elizabeth were probably much like we would have been. How am I going to explain this to my friends? You know, boy, this is, this is going to be different. But the angel tells them, don't be afraid. This is God's plan, and yes, God's going to change everything. And, and, and they're willing, and so God uses them Think about Mary and Joseph and, and as you look at the scripture of how that all takes place and, and it's such a familiar story that many times we, we just, we read over it so quickly, but imagine Joseph, what a story. I mean, Joseph having to be convinced that Mary was faithful to him. Joseph having to be convinced to raise a child that is not his. And this is not just any child. You're gonna be raising the son of God. And he's gonna take away the sins of the world. And he's going to change the world. And, and, and Joseph, you, you remember how the play portrayed that as we read it in scripture. Joseph's thinking about how can I get out of this? How can I do this the best way? And yet Joseph and Mary both, again, agreeing like Zachariah and Elizabeth, agreeing that they're going to do this. Paul, Paul, as he describes himself, Paul says, I was a Jew of the Jews. I studied at the feet of Gamil. Paul says, this was my life. I, I was so committed to this, I killed Christians. Think about that. But when I encountered Christ, everything changed. And so Paul comes along now and Paul facing certain death. Paul looking at this, Paul says, everything that was a benefit to me, now because of my relationship with Christ, I just consider that as, 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 as filth, as waste. And I think about my relationship with Christ. He says, more than that, look at what he says in verse eight, more than that, I consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, because of him. How many of us can say, because of my relationship with Christ, I've suffered great loss? How many of us can say, because of my relationship with Christ, before the end of this coming year, I'm probably going to be beheaded. Think about what would happen if that were to be. 
Would it change how you respond? Would it change what you do in the morning? Would it change your decisions? Would it change your resolutions? It did for Paul. It did for Zachariah and Elizabeth. It did for Joseph and Mary. It did for the shepherds. It did for the wise men. It changed everything. And so we look at this new year and we have opportunities in front of us and we have challenges in front of us and, and much of it we don't even know. I look at each of you. I look at some things that you've shared with me. I look at some things that you've gone through, some things that I know you're going through. And I think of the changes that's going to come this year. And for many of us, that means we're going to need Jesus. We're going to need him bad. And Paul was in that position. Paul says, I'm to that place. I recognize, I have a relationship with him, but I see it as more important than ever now because of what the future is going to hold. Look at what Peter said in, in, in Peter in his letter. Peter, in, in 1 Peter chapter one, Peter, he, he's talking about trials coming, just like Paul looked at trials. You remember Peter is the one that when Jesus called him, Peter said, I'll follow you to the death. Peter is the one that when, when Jesus said, I'm going to wash your feet, and Peter says, you're not washing my feet. And you'll remember Jesus said, if I don't, you'll have no part of me. And, and that Peter said, oh, well, not just my feet, but my hands and my, wash it all. And Jesus said, that's not necessary. What was Jesus saying? I'm looking at your attitude. I'm looking at your willingness I'm looking at your mindset when you think about me, Jesus. Jesus was saying to Peter. And that's the same Peter, that's the same Peter that the night Jesus was going to be, was being arrested, that, that took his sword out and cut off a, a soldier's ear. He was willing to do it. He was willing to fight to the death. He meant what he said. But then he got by the campfire and a little girl said, you're one of them. And what changed for Peter? But Peter got to thinking about what had happened with Jesus being arrested. What was about to happen to Jesus? He's going to be crucified. And Peter thinking about that, Peter says, I don't know him. Denied him. And that same Peter, if you'll remember just a few short days later, when Jesus said, it's necessary that I die, it's necessary that I go away, because if I don't go away, I can't send the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came and filled Peter, that same Peter that had denied Jesus, but now because of the power of the Holy Spirit in Peter, Peter is able to stand on the day of Pentecost and preach a message so powerful. And I think in that message, he probably told his testimony. And as he told that testimony and the Holy Spirit filling him, some 3,000 people responded and were saved during that Holy Spirit inspired message. This is that Peter that sometime now later is writing to the church and he's thinking about his life and this is what he says concerning trials, concerning circumstances, concerning things you're going to go through. And Peter says in 1 Peter chapter one, beginning in verse number six, rejoice in this. Think about that. What am I to be happy about? What am I to rejoice in? What's gonna bring me joy in the Lord? Unspeakable and full of glory. And this is what Peter says, rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have had to struggle in various trials. Life's not always easy. Life can be very difficult. Choices and decisions that we just don't know what tomorrow holds, we don't know what the year holds. 
Peter says, rejoice in this, though now for a short time you've had to struggle in various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, God allows these things to happen so that the genuineness to prove that your faith is real, that this relationship is real, that you won't deny him when the pressure is on like Peter did before the Holy Spirit. And Peter says that you've struggled in various trials, so the genuineness of your faith, and look at how he describes this faith, more valuable than gold which perishes though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor. What? at the revealing of Jesus Christ. Peter is saying Jesus makes a difference. You're gonna face troubles. You're gonna face difficulties. Things aren't always going to be easy this coming year, but when those difficult times come, remember where your faith is and who your faith is in. Look at what Paul goes ahead to say. Go on down to verse nine of Philippians chapter three. He's looking at, at what he considers a, a back set, what he considers this, this trial, this loss, this difficult circumstance. Remember, he knows he's about to be beheaded. Be found in Jesus, be found in him, capital H-I-M. Be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law. Remember, he was a Jew he practiced the Old Testament. He lived by the law, but he says that's not enough. Sacrifice is not enough. But one that is through faith in Christ. Faith in Christ. Remember when the trials come, when the tests come, when the difficulties come, when the doctor says, I'm sorry, but you have Remember when the boss comes in and says, I'm sorry, but we're shutting down, the job's going away. And you wonder, how are we gonna get through this? Paul says, you're gonna get through it through your faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. Philippians chapter three and verse nine. He's saying, I trust in him, although I don't know the outcome. I don't know how this is going to, to play out, but I know my faith is in Christ. And Paul is saying, it's not me. I don't find strength in me. It's not my self-righteousness. It's not my practice of the law. It's not what I do. But it's in him and what he's done, what he did on the cross. And remember, what he did on the cross Oftentimes we overlook what happens after that. That's the resurrection and the ascension. And when we have those, we know Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Look at what Paul says as he's writing to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. We don't dare classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. They brag on themselves. He said, we don't, we don't brag on ourselves but in measuring themselves by themselves. What's he saying? Be careful who you compare yourself to. It's not about what somebody else does, what somebody else did, what grandma did, but this is a personal relationship. Just you and Christ, me and Christ, and our relationship. And Paul says there, be careful about who you compare yourselves, who you measure yourself by. In measuring themselves, the second part of verse number 12, 2 Corinthians 12, 10, be careful in measuring, because in measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves to themselves, they lack understanding. It comes back to what he's saying here to the Philippians as he's encouraging them. Philippians chapter three and verse number 10, my goal, and this should be our goal. This should be, if we're gonna have a resolution, this should be our resolution. Whatever else our resolution involves, whatever, it's, it, whatever our, 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 we're gonna try to do, everything we do should be based on this. My goal, and this should certainly be all of our goal, is to know Him, capital H-I-M, and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His suffering, being conformed to His death, assuming that I will somehow, well, this is Paul talking, 
assuming that somehow I will reach the resurrection from among the dead. What's Paul saying? I'm probably going to die and soon. But that's just temporary. That's part of life. That's not the end of it. Why? Because there's something beyond this life. And that's the resurrected life. What God has prepared for us. The gospel has miraculous power. And the way that God presents this for us in, in whatever we look at, whatever we uh, choose, our choices, our decisions as we face the new year, this power that, that gets us through it is the power of the gospel. You remember the little song, God's not finished with me yet? He's still working on me. That, that's what Paul is basically saying here. Paul, St. Paul, Paul that had founded all of these churches, Paul that wrote these letters to these churches, Paul that wrote the majority of our New Testament, and Paul is saying, God's not finished with me yet. And so the mantra for us is like it would be for Paul. Look at what he says there. Assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection. This is not the end. This is not the, the end of all to, 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 to mean all. Go on down to verse number 12. And this is Paul. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already fully mature. This is Paul. God's not finished with me yet. This is how he sings the song. Not that I've already reached the goal or that I'm already fully mature, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. And then he calls them brothers because he's talking to the church. He's talking to us. And look at what he says there. I do not, verse 13, I do not consider myself to have taken hold. I haven't arrived. But this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, if you want to live a life pleasing to Christ, if you want to hear Christ say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. When this is all over, Paul says, this is how we have to live our life. Therefore, all who are mature, what's that mean? A Christian that's growing. You've heard me say before that Christianity is progressive. I, I was saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. It, it's a progression. And as we mature, as we grow in Christ by being in God's word and, and daily prayer life and being in a relationship with Jesus every day and growing that relationship. Verse 15, therefore, all who are mature should think this way. And if you think differently about anything, if you've asked God for that wisdom, if you've asked God for that strength, if you've asked God for that faith, for that increase in faith, God will reveal this also to you. And so as we come to the close of 2019, as we look to the beginning of 2020, we should know none of us have arrived. We're not there. Paul wasn't there. We're not complete. We're not matured yet. We've still got a long way to go. But Paul is saying, don't quit. Keep trusting Jesus. Keep trusting in the word. Don't lose sight of the prize. Keep pressing forward, forgetting those things that are behind. I want to take you to three scriptures that Paul wrote as we look to the new year to show that we're not on our own, that, that Jesus will help us to do this as we set our goal. And these are the three scriptures as we set our resolutions, our goals, plans, whatever you want to call it. These are the three scriptures that, that I'm not doing this alone, but I have the promise that God will strengthen me, that Jesus will lead me through that. And whatever I face, I can do it in the strength of Christ based upon these three scriptures that Paul leaves us with. Romans chapter eight. Verse 
Right after that chapter 8, verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to those that love God, those called according to his purpose. This is the verse right here, verse 29, to show that we're never alone in that. For those he foreknew. You see, God knows everything about you. And when you're in the middle of that hurt, that heartache, that trial, when you don't think you can put one foot in front of the other, God knows everything about that situation. And it didn't just occur to him. He knew this was going to happen to you. He knew this was going to knock you off of your feet. He knew this was going to, to, to just hit you and, and, and knock your faith and your props out from under you. And this is what he says, for those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He knew Peter was gonna deny him. He knew Peter would need the Holy Spirit. That's why he had that all arranged, not just for Peter, but for us. Those he foreknew, he predestined, he conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. Now, look at the next thing Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We all, the church, with unveiled faces, God sees in the heart. God sees everything about us. The, the most deepest, darkest secret, God knows that. We with unveiled faces, looking in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. God's the one doing the changing in us. It's, it's not us. God does this in us. He did it in Peter. He did it in Paul. Looking in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, from beginning to end. This is from the Lord who is, and look at what he describes the Lord as, capital S-P-I-R-T, the spirit that lives in our hearts. God knew we couldn't do this alone. God knew we needed the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And so God, he made it that way. God the Father, the Creator, God the Son, the Redeemer, God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that comes to live in us, to strengthen us, to make us able to go through all of these difficulties. And then going back at the beginning of what Paul says here to the Philippians, and remember that I'm not doing this alone. These three passages let me know God is with me every step. The Holy Spirit is with me. Jesus is with me. Philippians 1, 6 I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you. Do you remember when you were first saved? Do you remember when you recognized you needed God to forgive you of your sins and you asked God to forgive you and he did? That's the same God that will get you through any trial you're facing. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. That's either the day that you close your eyes in death and you go to meet him, or he calls an end to all of this and we hear the trumpet, we see the sky split, we see the angels coming with the Lord and he transforms us in an instant, whichever happens first. I'm sure of this, that he who begun a good work will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What a great perspective to go into the new year. I don't have to do it alone. I don't have to face it alone. I may not be in a trouble or a trial right now. Thank God if you're not. And if you are, whatever you're facing, whatever tomorrow brings, whatever January 1 brings, whatever 2020 brings, we don't have to face it alone. He is with us. Jesus made that promise. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you.